Welcome back to part two of our three-part S-Corporation series. Now, if you have not listened to part one, please go back and listen because you'll understand the context of what we're going to talk about in today's episode, which is reasonable salary. So we talked about in part one, how as the owner of the Nest Corporation, you're required to pay a reasonable salary and you're going to pay yourself a little differently than you did as an LLC owner. If you came from just having an LLC to being taxed as an S Corp. So as an S Corp, you're required to pay yourself that reasonable salary through payroll. Now your salary does not mean you're just transferring money from business account to personal. That doesn't count as salary. It has to be run as wages through payroll and have payroll taxes paid on it. And that actually means you're going to get a W-2 from your company at the end of the year. You're treated as an employee. So payroll taxes are imposed on the salary, but not on the remainder of your profit, resulting in potentially significant tax savings. Now you still have the ability, keep this in mind, you still have the ability to take owner's draws out of the business, but only if you first pay yourself that reasonable salary. I treat this like eat your vegetables before dessert. Okay. We've got to pay the salary enough that we've checked the box before we can just dig in and take whatever we want without payroll taxes. So the big question that remains is what the hell constitutes a reasonable salary, especially as a new business owner. And trust me, that's a great question. We're going to dive into that. So as we discussed in part one, if the salary is what you pay payroll taxes on, you can imagine that tax agencies, the IRS, prefer that you pay more in salary during the tax year and that they can collect more. That's what they want. They want you to pay more in salary. Conversely, you're playing tug of war with them because you want to pay as little salary as possible because that's what the tax is on. So you don't want to pay as much taxes. So as a result, we're in this tug of war game and we have to figure out this magical spot in between where they will be happy enough. And so will you. And that's really the, the reasonable salary piece. The IRS gives no explicit guidance on this. It is completely judgmental. And that is what makes it so difficult and yet so fun for us accountants to figure out because there is no guidance. And therefore the IRS can come to you and say, we disagree. We think your salary should be X, Y, Z. And because of that, the, the responsibility on the business owner to document and to keep track of how they want to defend their reasonable salary is paramount. So that means that you're going to have to have more than just, well, I felt like this was okay as your defense, but we'll get into what you'll need for that. Now, if you forget to pay yourself that salary, then you're basically going shark diving, holding a bunch of chum for the IRS. Okay. Because that, that big goose egg, that zero on the S corp tax form under owner's compensation is audit bait. It's audit bait. So if you want to avoid an audit, pay yourself something as a reasonable salary, even if you can't get around to figuring out the reasonableness, or you feel like you're kind of lost in the mix of all of this, anything but zero is better than zero because the IRS will go after any low or, or zero amounts in that owner's compensation bucket. So make sure you've got your basis covered by paying yourself that salary. I cannot say that enough. So there's a reason why this is a whole episode guys. So what should, <laughs> what should you pay yourself? It depends. It always depends. Uh, they leave a lot up to interpretation, but let's talk about the key factors we look at when we figure out your reasonable salary. So we look at your level of experience and expertise. Are you seen as a mentor in your industry? Are you seen as someone highly qualified? Do you typically command a higher price point because of your level of experience, expertise, and so on? We look at your duties and responsibilities. How much are you working in the business versus on the business? How much are you actually serving as the primary technician? Are you pretty much the person that everyone's coming to see and they're paying for to serve them? How much time do you spend in the business? Not just in terms of how much time are you spending serving clients, but what are you spending on administrative and marketing activities? What is the compensation of a non-shareholder employee at your company? So how much are your employees making? Because as you can imagine, if you're trying to argue that you make less than your employee, that's going to be a tough one to argue, especially if their responsibilities are significantly lower than yours. We look at comparable businesses, what they're paying, 
We look at the market rate of a salary for your position. So we like to look at sources like ZipRecruiter, LinkedIn, Indeed. We try to see what on the market in your state, in your locality is, is going right now for that type of professional. So, you know, for me as an accountant, right, I can look up an accountant salary in Connecticut right now and get a feel for how much an accountant should be making right now when I go to do my S corporation salary. And then the last thing we look at, which is actually, in my opinion, one of the most important is your business's profitability. <laughs> because at the end of the day, if you can't support the market rate of a salary, then what's the point, right? You're probably thinking, Shannon, okay, I get it. But somebody doing my job makes a hundred to 150 K a year. I can't afford to pay myself that I'm making like a 20 K profit. We got you. We got you. It will make sense. So there isn't a one size fits all formula. Okay. This is a starting point but you want your salary to be as defensible as possible with the IRS. So we have a shortcut method you can use as a baseline. And then we have a more robust calculation that we use. Now, I'm not going to take you through all the math that that would not be a good way to spend this podcast. What I am going to do is give you the, the elements that we use, because first of all, these are not trade secrets. Second of all, I want you to feel empowered to go and do some of the legwork and research to figure out what makes the most sense for you, or just have an appreciation for the process that we go through because there, this is a process. So pulling a number out of thin air is just not going to cut it. So we have a shortcut method. So if you want to shortcut it and you want to, you know, if you feel like you're not making enough profit to back up this salary that you think that you may actually need to get paid. This is for you. The shortcut method is to base your reasonable salary off of your business profits. So this applies when maybe you don't have enough profit yet to pay the typical annual salary, or if you're, you're pretty much new, or you really don't know what the reasonable salary should be. A good baseline would be roughly, and I would say no lower than 30% of your profit based on tax cases I've read, based on experience and what I've looked at, I say that the IRS typically doesn't like seeing a salary lower than 30% of your profit because they do use that when they look at reasonableness. So lower than 30% of profits and no-go, I would make it 30 to 50% of your profit roughly. We want to aim somewhere in that range. So what you want to do is figure out your potential expected profit for the year. So we're in 2022. And you want to figure out, well, how much do I expect to make in profit? Take about, in my opinion, take about 25% of that. Because if you underperform, if you underperform what you think you're going to do, what I don't want you to do is end up accidentally paying 70 or 80% of your profit in salary when you go to set your salary and your payroll service. So you want to make sure that you're tracking this and you're actually looking at it quarter over quarter to make sure you're not overpaying salary because you're missing out on tax savings by doing that. You're just losing the S corp benefit, right? So I say I am for 20 to 25% of that to program your salary and then top it off as you find out that you're earning more. I always compare this, and this is a silly analogy, but I think it works. It's like coffee and creamer. Once you put too much cream in the coffee, there is no turning back. <laughs> once you put too much creamer in, you can't go back. So once you've paid yourself too much payroll, you can't revert. You can't take it out. You can't back up. You can't go back in time. You cannot turn back time. So because of that, I just say only do a little bit at a time. And then when you feel like you're getting really, really close, top it off with an extra off cycle payroll. And there's your salary. That's what I recommend my clients do. Okay. So when we talk about paying yourself that salary, you can use a rough range of 30 to 50% of your expected profit and make sure you're in that range at the end of the year. And you should be good to go as a baseline. Now you're going to have to adjust this for all the other factors we talked about, like your expertise and the going rate and what your other employees make, you're going to have to adjust to factor in all of these things so that the story looks good from every dimension. So let's talk about what you can do if you have more resources at your disposal. And I should mention that 30 to 50% method is really hard to defend to the IRS based on the pure calculation. 
you need to justify it with a little bit more documentation and a little bit more research. So the second method we're going to talk about for reasonable salary is more developed in that situation. And it's much more defensible to an IRS agent. So when you can use method two, if you're stuck in a pinch, use method one. So second method. Now you want to start by examining the amount of time you spend working in your business versus on your business. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you, if you've read the e-myth, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but we're talking about how much time do you spend as the technician versus the entrepreneur? So let's say you run a beauty salon. How much time are you spending actually in client appointments doing their, maybe doing their brows, their hair? How much are you spending doing their service versus administrative and marketing activities? What is the pie chart of your time? And by the way, it is a really good idea as a pro tip to be tracking and logging this periodically anyway, because you want to know how many income producing hours you're generating and also how much time you're spending in versus on the business as an owner and how that will shift over time. So it's a really good idea to measure this as a metric anyway, but if you want to really have a good handle on how much time you're spending and how that affects your salary, tracking this even for a month is going to be a really, really helpful tool for you. So And here's another example. If you're running a coaching business, how many time are you spending sitting on zoom? (laughs) Most likely (laughs) uh, actually coaching clients versus doing some of those additional tasks. So you want to analyze this using multiple sources. You want to see what your job would pay in the market. You want to use those tools. I talked about zip recruiter, indeed LinkedIn. Maybe you have industry specific job boards that you can reference. Maybe you can go on Upwork and Fiverr and you can actually save postings for similar jobs and what those projects cost. This would be really interesting to find similar people on freelancing sites, similar to you and what they go for. There is an abundance of information out there right now that you can use to defend what you're going to choose as your reasonable salary. So once you identify an annual market rate of salary, adjust this for the time that you spend working in the business. What we wanna do is show compensation for the time you're spending as the technician. So the reasonable salary, think of it this way. You're paying yourself as an employee of the business for the work you're doing as an employee of the business. So in the business to serve clients or to serve the the mission of the business other than running it from the owner's perspective. So for example, if the going market rate for your role in the, you know, on Indeed is $100,000, and you spend about 40% of your time working in the business as a technician, then start with a $40,000 annual salary baseline. And I say baseline because again, we have to adjust for all of these other factors, right? All of these other different things that come into play, but this could be a great starting point. And you'll want to look at special certifications, training expertise that you have, of course, And, and to keep track of how much time you're spending again is pivotal because now you can actually back this up. You're going to want to have this documented. I'm telling you in case of an audit or just to have handy. And this is something we do for our clients. We actually do a documentation. We do a study of the reasonable salary and keep that for you. So, um, again, adjust it for time, adjust it for your expertise and make sure that you're looking at all of the different factors here. So what happens? Let's talk about a few scenarios, right? These are the the sort of FAQs we get about reasonable salary. So you're probably thinking, okay, Shan, that's a lot. (laughs) Uh, We've got a reasonable salary. We can try to figure out here, take a shot in the dark, but we have a few questions. What happens if you don't have profit? What if you have nothing left in your business at the end of the year, from an operation standpoint, you have no operating income, no profit. What do you do? Okay. There's a couple of things here. A business in a lost position may not be expected to pay an owner's salary unless you've taken out owner's draws during the year. So the IRS is a stickler for this. If you're taking money out of the business as owner's draws, which by the way, side note, 100% an S corporation, S corporation owner can take out owner's draws can. Yes, you can. However, they want you to eat your vegetables first. <laughs> That is the dessert. Don't go for the cookie jar until you finished your damn broccoli. That's what they want you to do. So here's the thing. They say, 
what if I, what if I don't have anything? What if there's no broccoli on the table? Can I still take cookies? Here's the thing. So if you're in a lost position, you don't have profit, you don't have to pay yourself a salary, but there's a big, but here, if you took out owner's draws during the course of the year, then they're going to reclassify those as wages. You're going to be responsible for paying the payroll taxes. You're going to be responsible for interest and penalties, et cetera, et cetera, because they're going to see that as, well, if you could afford to pay something, then why didn't you pay salary? It's literally your mom going, well, if you're hungry, eat the broccoli, not the cookies. It's like, I'm hungry. And you go for the snack box. It's like, well, if you're hungry, go eat those. And you're like, no, but I'm not hungry for that. I want the other thing. The IRS is basically your mom <laughs> telling you, you can't do that. So you guys get it. So you're running the risk of the IRS reclassifying your draws. And you want to make sure that you've, you know, you've shown that you haven't pulled any money out during the year. Now, here's the other thing. If you have not had profit, if you've not taken draws, let's say you've kept all the money in the business and you're saying, okay, Shan, I didn't pay yourself salary, but I didn't take any draws. Well, the next year, when you finally do, they're going to reclassify any draws as wages and they're going to expect you to catch up your salary. So they're going to want you to pay what you should have paid last year in salary on top of that year's salary. So the best thing to do, in my opinion, if I had to, to summarize this into one little nugget for you is just pay yourself what you can as a reasonable salary. If you don't have any profit, don't take draws out, uh, or they could be reclassified. You're going to want to, if you have to, you can always reinvest into your business. You can inject cash into your business in order to pay payroll if you must if you feel like that you, you fell behind. Now we're recording this early enough in the year in 2022, where I hope this hasn't happened to you yet. And we can avoid that problem, but make sure you're eating that broccoli first. That's all I can say. Now, what if you need more money in, from your business? What if your lifestyle commands a bigger amount of money than what I'm telling you to pay yourself in reasonable salary? Now I told you, we wanna minimize salary. So for some of my clients, I have to break the news to them I'm doing air quotes, break the news to them that, uh, your salary is going to be 10 grand. Your salary is going to be 20 grand. And they look at me like, um, that will not even cover my rent. What are you talking about? I say, don't worry about it because the salary that you're paying as an S corporation owner is just a check the box thing. It is in order to save you money in taxes. So aside from your salary, you can pull out owner's draws whenever you want to. But like I said, just make sure you've got your basis covered with a reasonable salary first. That's all I ask. Pay yourself that salary. Then you can take out as much as you want in draws up to your basis, which we'll cover in another episode. But if you've made a certain amount of profit in the year, you can pull out the rest of that profit, no problem. And you can pull that out whenever you need to without causing a taxable event, meaning you're not going to owe more in taxes just by moving your money from your business to your personal account. That is not an income producing event. So don't worry about that. You have the liberty to pull that out as you need it. And if you need more money than your salary allows for, then go for it, take it out. But if you have any questions, do talk to your accountant about what that would actually entail. Now you're also probably thinking, oh gosh, how the heck do I set up payroll? This sounds intimidating. Payroll sounds like a monster. I don't want to run payroll. Just the thought of that, I could tell you you're saving $50,000 a year. And there are still some people out there who are thinking, uh, <laughs> $50,000 a year. I don't know. Like, what do I have to do? How do I run this thing? How do I run payroll? I don't want to go through all that. Don't worry. We make it really easy. We recommend using a payroll platform like Gusto. Gusto is our solution of choice. It's what we use in our firm. And I could not recommend it enough. We're going to have a, a link in the show notes, by the way. Go check out the show notes for a link to sign up with Gusto. They make it so stupid easy <laughs> to sign up and to get everything set up. And we help you along the way. If you subscribe to our S Corp service, we actually do a lot of the Gusto, Gusto setup for you. So you actually just have to go in and click run payroll. I think the average time to run payroll is less than 11 minutes. So, and that's even if you're not on autopilot. So it's actually really, really easy and less intimidating than you think. So they take care of the payroll processing. They take care of tax withholding and reporting. So all you really have to do is click run payroll. They will do all the filings and they will just take it from there. 
and they have a support team ready to help you. If you have any questions, you can even manage your benefits and HR solutions in there as well. So without, and by the way, I'm not sponsored by Gusto, but that is our preferred solution. And that is what I recommend that you would use for payroll, especially if you're intimidated by the thought of running it. So remember, remember that the reasonable salary requirement applies to S corporation owners. If you're listening to this episode and you have an LLC, the first step is to file for the S corporation election. And then you can start paying yourself that reasonable salary as an LLC owner. You should not be running payroll for yourself. That is not part of the deal as an, as an LLC. Um, the salary requirement is just one example of an additional responsibility you have as an S corp owner to experience, experience these tax savings. And when you file the S corp election, just remember you can file it, uh, up until March 15th. So we're getting a little close there. So just remember that is the deadline to file the S corp election for the current year. So if you want to become an S corporation or to get the election, I should say, then you can file up until March 15th. Otherwise you have a late election and we have to write a little doctor's note (laughs) explaining why we're late. But, uh, if you can, if you're interested in this, do get in touch with us. If you think this would be a beneficial, uh, change for your business, text me the word S corp to the number 860-609-6374, which will be in the show notes. Let's work on getting you set up before that deadline and stay tuned for part three in our series. We're going to talk about another tax savings tool that the S corporation owner gets to use called the accountable plan. So beyond the thousands of dollars you're going to save with the S corporation, potentially, we also have an additional trick up our sleeves to help you reimburse some of your mixed use business and personal expenses called the accountable plan. And that is going to be a huge tax saver for a lot of you. I know. So tune into part three and I'll see you over there.